Freddie King. Uh, I'm the HR director for the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership, uh, we provide economic development growth to the city and the county of St. Louis. So we're, we act as kind of that that quasi governmental non for profit arm to provide some some great progress for uh, our, our county and city uh, participants. So it's a pleasure to be here and, and to, to uh, speak with everybody. I'm going to be talking about hiring practices today, and in this, I will also talk about um, COVID and, and some situations that have happened. So just please be aware. I will also preface with, uh, similar to uh, Bob asked a question at the beginning of this, uh, you know, when are things being lifted? How are things changing? I'll be very candid with you all. This changes on a daily basis. And so it is really tough to be able to speak to things. There are a lot of laws. There are also not a lot of policies and laws. And so we'll talk through some of that as it relates. But predominantly, our conversation today will be focused on hiring people and, and how to get them in and how do we do that uh, in our COVID situation. And then, uh, Venus, how do I switch slides? Just let me know, I can switch it. Okay, next slide. Perfect. So first and foremost, when we talk about talent acquisition and, and retention, uh, I always refer to the employee life cycle. Each one of us are in a phase in our employment cycle uh, at, at a constant time. We're going to first focus on the first two, which is recruitment and selection and onboarding and orientation. But know that there's a lot of, of uh, steps in this that, that we're all somehow a part of. Uh, but the first thing is recruitment and selection. So it, it, there's a lot of challenges as an employer. At how do you recruit? How do you select the right individuals? I will tell you that during the COVID situation, it is increasingly tough to hire the right people. And, and you have added challenges. Uh, traditionally, if you've recruited and hired individuals, you might have gone to a career fair, you might have posted the job on uh, you know, a bunch of websites and, and uh, you know, in your newspapers and so on and so forth. It's become increasingly challenging, even for someone that like me that does this on a regular basis. Um, I will tell you there are plenty of resources out there to still effectively recruit for your businesses. Um, I will, it's a couple that I use. I love using uh, LinkedIn. So for those of you that are, you know, have professional businesses, a lot of people have LinkedIn and uh, LinkedIn offers a, uh, a kind of a professional version that you have to pay for. It's very worth it because you can see anyone in your network that uh, or, or in the surrounding area, really across whoever has a, a LinkedIn profile as to who matches with your, your jobs and such. Um, another one that I see a lot of great successes with is Indeed, which is another online platform. I'll tell you that if you're not using uh, uh, online applications or you're not using online postings, it is really important, especially in today's coronavirus situation, because a lot of individuals are not going into the public. They're not pulling those traditional papers. You know, I, I went into the office this morning and I've got about six months worth of newspapers that I haven't looked at. And think about it, if I was looking for a job, those are missed opportunities. So, you know, be creative in thinking, how can we recruit and attract individuals? Uh, selection, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I challenge you in your recruitment, think about the right kind of individual that you're looking for for your organization and figure out how or how you recruit for that right individual. So for instance, if I'm hiring a banker, I'm going to try and find some banking organizations or some you know banking clubs that I can go and speak with. Um, I, uh, for a period of time, was HR at Lowe's. And uh, during our seasonal staffing periods, I would actually go to the local gardening clubs to hire my, my lawn and garden people, uh, which is something different. You know, you don't, not everyone thinks of a garden club. When we also, uh, the next phase is onboarding and orientation. This is increasingly tough too in, the, uh, in our situation. Um, if you imagine, traditionally, you probably sat down with your new employee or uh, they sat down with another one of your employees. That's not really happening in today's world. Even if you're working in the office, you may still be maintaining a, a distance of six feet or any other variety of measures. I'll tell you that you know, in the onboarding and orientation phase, this is the first impression your employee gets of your organization. And so it really is important to make sure that you're putting the best foot forward. And I'll tell you, as a person that has hired in this situation, it is very tough to produce a good onboarding experience for an individual 
all remotely. Uh, my last individual w- worked in uh, Illinois, and I did it from my hometown in Washington, Missouri. It's it's very difficult to try and make that happen, but uh, you know you have to find the right resources to make that happen. And similar to the technology that we're using today, Zoom and WebEx have been the two awesome resources that that I have been able to very successfully use. Zoom offers and WebEx offers share screens. So if you have a very uh, technological-based job, you can, you know, when you're showing somebody the the tools and networks that they need, you can probably zoom in with them and see, you know, what kind of resources, share your screen, show them step-by-step, all the things that you might normally do. For some that are very hands-on, uh, you know, it, 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 you have to you have to be creative, and, and maybe it is a I show you Zoom from afar, or maybe I record myself and share it with you from home or, or whatever it might be. But again, creativity is the key here. Um, again, with the onboarding and orientation, I think the other piece that's that's really important is connectivity. I think all of us, in some regard or another, have felt disconnected from each other, our employees, our uh, our other employers friends and family. And when you hire a new individual, they're anxious, they're nervous, they're afraid. And it's your job to bridge the gap and getting those individuals to meet each other. And what I've done is coordinate team meetings so that when I'm having somebody meet, they're meeting via Zoom or, or whatever that measure is. So again, just be, be very creative in that. Um, again, other life cycles or other cycles in this training and development. So once we have a person established in our organization, we want to train and develop them to the level that we need them at. Um, And that's simply what that is. Performance management. So once we have them at that level, if their performance is going great, how do we promote them? How do we grow their skills? Or let's say their performance isn't that great. How do we coach them and talk to them to make them a better employee or unfortunately may have to separate with the organization? And lastly, transition. We're all transition, or we all will transition at one point or another in our life. And that may mean that we're retiring. That may mean that we're promoting and moving into a new role. That may mean that we're uh, uh, moving into another organization. We're all in some phase of this. And it's all right sometimes to kind of regress. So I've, I've seen that a lot between the training, and development, and performance management pieces. As I take on additional responsibilities, I may need to go back to training and development to better understand my role. Next slide, please. So the first thing, when you are deciding how you develop or post a position or bring a person on, I really encourage you all to have a conversation internally, whether it's it's you thinking, what do I need out of this individual or talking to your team members to see how what they need for support or what they need this role to look like. I have commonly in my HR departments, I've talked to individuals to say, okay, I'm going to hire an HR generalist. What do I need their role to look like that will help support you and grow you, also capturing the things that I need to, need this individual to take care of? Job descriptions are fundamental. And I'll tell you, everyone should have a job description in your organization. I, I don't care the size. You know, It could be a small organization of two. It could be an organization of 5,000. I will tell you that at some point or another, there could potentially be legal implications. And in the, you know, I, I have been to court a handful of times and I've experienced this nine times out of 10, state governments, federal governments will request job documentation. And it's super important to be able to encapsulate what this person does in a legal capacity, but also how you uh, think of this as a great tool to, to demonstrate to your employee to say, you know, this is also what I'm expecting of you. This goes great into performance management. If somebody's missing on some key element, you can refer back to a job description and say, you know, we discussed that this is your role and this is what it looks like. You know, why are we failing in this regard? Um, I will tell you that job descriptions, again, are very key. And I've included some things that, you know, this list is not inclusive, all inclusive. So you can, you can add, you can subtract. Um, But it's really important to have job identification. So what's the title? What's the reporting structure? How do they relate in the organization? Position summary. So what is that that kind of uh, brief paragraph that explains what this role is? What are minimum qualifications? So what are you willing not to accept from somebody that is taking this role? What are the duties and responsibilities? List them out. It's all right in a rough draft to just list everything and anything out. Because then you start to go, okay, this is exactly what I want. How do I make these sentences and structures better? Personal characteristics. 
some organizations hire based on a lot of different qualities. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a couple, I, I'm failing to come up with an example of a, an organization, but there are a couple that base uh, their hires on personality, for instance, is how optimistic or happy are you? Um, if you don't demonstrate a very positive and optimistic attitude, they're not interested in your, your experience. And so if you have very unique personal characteristics that apply in your organization, this is important to mention that. The same with physical demands. Um, I'll share, you, share with you a funny story. As I started my HR career um, it, with the Lowe's, uh, Lowe's companies. I uh, hired somebody from my outside lawn and garden area, and they were going to be my outside lawn and garden loader which basically means you're going to be outside in the hot, in the rain, and you're going to load heavy things. When this person made it all the way through the process, they figured out they're going to be out in the heat lifting heavy things. And they said, no, 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 I can't do that. Well, one, I'm confused because the title said outside lawn and garden loader, but two, clearly I wasn't descriptive enough. And how do I get this person to understand their roles? And so a job description is a great resource, a great tool to use to say, okay, you're going to be lifting 50 pounds or more, or this is, this is how you're going to be working or what it's going to be, the conditions are going to look like. And to that point, working conditions, is your organization located in a, uh, a freezer? Is it located in you know, non-air conditioned elements? Are you standing all the time? These are really important things to consider if you're sitting all the time even. Um, there are, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into workers' comp too much on this, but you really have to think about this and, and what, how you disclose all this information to, the, to your employees or future employees. And also, too, you know, this is, a, this is a given performance standards. What does success look like in this role? Lastly, I always say, make sure that you include your EEO statement. And I'm sure all of you have seen one of these before. It's that statement that says, we are X organization and we do not discriminate on the basis of race, gender, religion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you need a good example of one of those, you can refer to uh, my company's website, stlpartnership.com, and go to our careers page. I've got a position up there right now, uh, the VP of Business Finance or Business Lending, and you can see and pull that up there. That That's a great one. Or... Um, my email can be provided after this, and I can I can send you a template that you can use for that. So continuing on the talent acquisition and retention phase, there are four steps in getting this new person in, right? One is screening. There's interview, assess and evaluate, and select an offer, okay? So when when I'm trying to figure out who's best for my organization and how do I fit with them, also tying into what's going on in today's circumstance too, it's pretty tough, right? You know, we all have probably interviewed somebody or we've been a part of interviews and normally, you know, you're meeting with them, you're putting on your best suits and, and, and skirts and so on and so forth. It's challenging, but how do you get that same impact in the situation that we have here? And what I've done to adapt in the circumstances for my screeners, I might get 50 applications to a role and it'll be my job to look through those resumes and see, okay, who is the best fit? And I might pull 10 individuals out of that stack. I'm not too invested in those individuals, but they're showing promise to me. I don't want to spend a lot of time, and I, I'm very busy. I know all of you are very busy uh, business owners as well. And so screening to me is, let's get on the phone for 30 minutes. Let's schedule some time, and let's talk through some questions. Why are you interested in my organization? Why, what attracted you here? Uh, why do you think you'd be a good fit? Walk me through your work experience. Those are questions that will last. And, you know, actually, I'll add one more. I really also think it's really important to talk about compensation. Some organizations, so for instance, I'm a quasi-governmental non-for-profit. I don't pay private industry banking standards. And so, you know, it's really important to say, you know, to ex-banker, for instance, that we don't pay at the private industry level. This is our compensation rate. Is that, you know, is that something you can deal with? I will tell you that, you know, Kansas City is a great example. Illinois is another great example. Asking the compensation question is a very tricky thing. Uh, I would imagine that in the very near future, asking somebody what they made in their last role will become illegal. And so I'm a big fan as an HR to say, it's going to be illegal one day to ask that question. So how can I get what I need and not create some undue bias or discrimination? And the question I always ask is, what is your expected salary? Now I'm building off of their preconception of what they're looking for a salary and not building that off of prior compensation. So that's really key to, to factor and take in as well. Um, but I ask all those questions in my pre-screen, and that normally takes about 30 minutes. It's a great way for me to get to know people, and it's a great way for me to weed people out too. 
Next is the interview process. So when I'm interviewing people, now I'm invested in you a little bit. I want to see what you look like, how you present yourself, how you answer questions, uh, and, and, and being able to see you. It's tough doing that over the phone. And again, I emphasize Zoom and WebEx are great resources. I just did an interview last week, and, and on the phone, the guy sounded very, very strong and confident. But when I looked at him, he exuded just nervousness and anxiety. And it's it just like, you know, is this portraying the best resemblance for what I need in, in this role? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and so you really, you know, it's great to be able to see those individuals. It's great to be able to put a name to a face and it's great for them to see you as well and, and your expressions. Um, you can also see how they're, they're answering your questions and such. In the interview phase, I will tell you, please be aware, be aware of asking the right questions and, and build those questions. I always say, if you have an HR in your, your organization, use them. This is where employers get in trouble the most. And, and whether it's getting too close with the individuals in the interview. So, for instance, I've seen some managers go, oh, that's great. You know, my, my child went to this school and that school. Do you have any children? Well, hang on a second. You've actually just violated the law. Um, I've also seen managers that have asked, you know, how old are you or, or you know, any other questions. And I see some laughing. Those are real things. You know, uh, and I, I ask for, you know, think about your interview. What are you wanting out of this role? And ask realistic questions that factor into that. I, I again, just another example, I, I've worked with uh, an organization and uh, one of the managers told me their, their favorite go-to question is, what's your favorite superhero and why? And I was really confused why they asked that question. And they said, well, you know, I, I'm just trying to see how they think on their feet. Well, do you think we can ask that in a different way? I, I just don't see how superheroes are really relevant. Um, and so again, try and ask your questions to make it relevant to the job that you're asking. So maybe instead of, if you're trying to understand how they think on their feet, maybe it's, tell me about a circumstance where you ran into a problem and you had to address it immediately. That's a great example to, to kind of assess and figure that out. Lastly, once you, or not lastly, step three, when you have done your interview and you've completed all your interviews, compare them side by side. Who meets your qualifications? Who answers best? Who represents your organization best? And then lastly, select an offer. Um, again, all of this is a very legal process. So what I'll tell you is that any application, any resume, any document that you use, save it. It could come back against you one day in a court of law. I have been in a court where uh, a, a jury of our peers had to say, why did you select this person over another person? And what saves me every time is those interviews and being able to put their resume side by side to the individual I selected. Um, again, educate yourselves on the interview process. That's really important. Make sure that you're doing the right kind of interview. Right kinds of interviews mean, you know, look at the personality of your organization. Maybe you're a really relaxed organization. Unstructured is a great way to do that. Meaning you and I are just going to have a conversation. Or maybe it's behavioral, meaning tell me about a time when you had to deal with blah. Again, if you have an HR, use them. They're great resources. And lastly, use a realistic job preview. And I know that, that there's, there's actually a lot of research on realistic job previews, and this is probably a new term for a lot of you. What I mean by realistic job preview is don't be afraid to show somebody the great qualities of your organization and also the not so great qualities of your organization. And I'll give you a great example of that. I, uh, again, to use another Lowe's example, sometimes you're going to have to be out in the heat and you're going to lift heavy things and it's going to be really nasty and you're going to have people yelling at you and they're not happy because you're not doing it quick enough and, and that's all right. But we also have great benefits here, there, and the other. Think about what are some great things of your organization, great things that your organization offers, but also make sure to include negative things too. Be realistic. What I've learned is that people will step into an organization and either be really excited because that's exactly what they're looking for, that challenge, or they realize, wow, that's, that's not at all what I wanted. And they'll self-select out, which saves you the cost and time of hiring an individual. To do a quick analysis for you, turnover costs your organization, that person's annual salary, by, by a one and a half, basically. So again, if, you're, if it's a $20,000 salary, you're paying $30,000 in total to replace that individual. That's a lot of money. Next slide, please. Also, in considering uh, hiring individuals, you also have to talk compensation, right? And so what I want you to be cognizant and aware of is 
compensation really uh, the, the role can really impact a lot of different laws, and we'll cover some of those in a moment. But think about what is this individual going to fulfill? What are they going to do? So maybe you're hiring individuals at a minimum wage basis. That's all right. That's that's your business structure. But be cognizant that there are changes on a on a state level, for instance, almost year by year now. And so really pay attention to see, does this make sense? You know, how, how do I factor this compensation into next year's minimum wage increase? Um, another local example that kind of covers the special issues under local law. I know that St. Uh, St. Louis City offers a different minimum compensation than the state. So just be cognizant of, of those changes. Overtime pay, uh, which kind of goes into the exemptions category. Is your person salary, meaning they can work 40 hours, they can work 50 hours, but they're paid at the same rate no matter what? Or are they paid hourly, meaning no matter what they do after 40 hours, they qualify for something called overtime, which is time and a half compensation. Be very careful with this. Uh, I will not cover this in this, this PowerPoint slide or in these slides, but know that the Fair FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, is very key on this. I have seen organizations that get audited by the, by the Department of Labor and get themselves in a lot of trouble, um, meaning they list somebody as salaried and their organization and, and the role that they're actually taking on is more of a hourly role. And what ends up happening is they're owing that individual back pay. You do not want to put yourself in that, order, that, that position. Next slide. A couple more on total rewards that we'll talk about as well. Total rewards is more than just compensation. And so let's say, for instance, you pay at a lower rate compared to your, your competitors. What are other things that you offer? Do you have paid time off, vacation and leave, maternity and, and paternity leave, flexible work hours? Think about what's going on in today's world. Can you offer flexible arrangements? That's key. And, and you know, as a person that does uh, interviews on a fairly regular basis, even before uh, COVID, I was getting questions about what kind of flexible work arrangements do you have? Is there, is there circumstances where I can work from home? Um, especially in today's world right now, people, the, and the number one question I, I get is, how are you adapting to the coronavirus situation? Um, again, other benefits, insurance. Do you provide insurance to your employees? Be cognizant of all of these things. Next slide. Other things to consider. I love diversity and inclusion. It's truly the center point to a successful organization. A phrase that I like to use is through diversity comes innovation of thought. And what that simply means is that if I hire people that look, sound, and think exactly like me, I'm only going to get the same results that I would provide. What I do as an HR uh, director and an HR manager is I surround myself with HRs that complement my strengths and opportunities. So I might be really strong in category X and Y, but I have some deficits too. We all do. So how do I bring on people that can complement my deficits so that I can be more successful? Again, if we're, really, if we're all really strong in one area, that means we're not covering other areas of, of, of what we need to be successful. So think about your organization. Think about how you can recruit through diversity and, and, and different uh, uh, individuals that don't look and sound like your organization or the people that represent it in your organization. I would say a good test is for the community that you serve and cater, your organization should look like that population. Um, so, you know, are you hiring? Uh, um, is it 100% Caucasian? Is it 100% African American? Is it 50-50? Think about the, 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 the demographics of your area. Your workforce should fairly represent that. Um, so think about that. Um, good diversity uh, initiatives should and, and will make you look really, really good. Um, it improves. Uh, there's so much research out there that talks about diversity and how it brings amazing results, improves creativity and innovation. Again, if I'm thinking one way and I find and I hire somebody that thinks in a little different, they're able to challenge my thoughts to say, hey, you know, have you considered this? That's a great thing. As long as it's, again, respectful, that's a great thing to have on your team, somebody that can think strategically and help you think through things. Um, I'll tell you, recruitment, retention, and branding, as well as market trends. So I, through a, a more diverse workforce is more accepting of each other and therefore has 
larger or longer uh, retention, meaning the turnover is not nearly as high or it's it's not nearly as high as what it would be in some other organization. Simply meaning you're going to have employees that stay with your organization longer because they're more accepting and more understanding. Um, and then market strengths and branding. I will tell you that as a person that that also regularly does does requests for uh, uh, proposals or qualifications, one of the questions I ask immediately every firm that I engage with is, "Are you a minority or women owned business?" I want to know because that's really important to me. I want to hire uh, organizations that offer diversity as a center point to their organization. And maybe they're not, but what programs are they working on to get their organization to be um, uh, a part of, you know, building a good diverse workforce? Next slide. Looking for is that coronavirus update. So I'm going to preface and tell you that I don't have all the answers. It is changing daily. Um, you know, it, it, a lot of this is decision making that happens at the local, the state, and the federal level. And and unfortunately, I'm not privy to all those fun stuff. But here's what I can tell you: there are some great resources out there to help you stay in the loop on what's going on and how do you adapt in your with your business. So a couple examples on a federal and state level: I love Sherm. So that's the Society for Human Resources Management. They have a uh, an app on your phone. They also have a website. Visit them regularly. Sign up to their sign up for their newsletter. They offer amazing resources that really keep you up to date on what's going on in today's uh, uh, situation. What laws are out there? How is how are the laws changing? And trust me, they are changing. So how does you, how does your organization adapt to those changes? Um, on a more local level. I'll, and I've included the websites here. The county and the city of St. Louis have websites. Pay attention to those. I even have to, you know, uh, I'll, I'll use the county for instance. I've even called their hotline, which is listed in their website, to ask a question on what do I do in this circumstance if I have an employee that does X. Um, they are a great resource and, and can be utilized uh, to help you answer better que or good questions on how the, the county is effectively addressing uh, personnel practices. Um, what I will tell you is, and I'm sure all of you know this, pay attention to the news. If you have social media, pay attention there too. I know all of our municipal leaders are really active on social media, and they do provide updates through that as well. Um, I will, and I'm going to speak more in a federal sense now. If you don't think that what's going on is impacting us and changing laws, it is. And so think about, I'm going to talk about four different federal laws and how that's changed a little bit and kind of then dig into some of the minutia of how we, how our businesses are getting impacted. So let's talk about OSHA. I'm sure all of us are somewhat familiar with OSHA. Those are work, you know, those are things that cover workers' compensation and health and safety for our employees. Let's talk, you know, let's say you're a business that requires uh, use of uh, N95 masks. I don't know if you know this, but if your business does require that, did you know that you have to have training and you have to document said training through OSHA? Um, if you have, if one of your employees, for instance, requests a audit of your workforce uh, and seeing how safe it is, or maybe there's some unsafe measure, OSHA has provisions out there that say, you know, this is a legal right that they have and that they have to go through. You, you as a business owner need to comply with that, otherwise face penalties from OSHA. Um, you know, I use the N95 mask example as a, as a great circumstance. Some people, you know, I, I know that a lot of that is dedicated to frontline workers. Um, but think, you know, if you're a frontline business and, and you are making your employees do that, what kind of training are you making them use? Because there is training out there that has to be that is required to use that. Um, ADEA or the Age, uh, Age Discrimination and Employment Act. For those of you that don't know, the magic number in this is 40 years of age. So anyone over the age of 40 is a covered entity under this law. So let's talk about the coronavirus. We know through study that the coronavirus impacts older populations more than younger populations in a negative health capacity. So I've seen some businesses that say, without knowing ADEA, they, they go, okay, well, they define what an older population is. So maybe it's, I'm going to send my employees that are 50 years and older home and work from home and those that are 50 or 49 years and younger are going to stay in the office to keep things supportive. What I'll tell you right now is you've just actually committed some age discrimination. And the reason why I say that is because you have a group from 40 to 50 that is now, you know, is over that age. 
and that is not being treated the same as other individuals in that same age category or protected category. So you run risks of, of again, age discrimination. I'll tell you that if you're making the decision to work from home or not work from home on an age basis too, it's probably not the best idea in general. Uh, FMLA or the Family Medical Leave Act and the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, those two go hand in hand. If you're not familiar with the CARES Act, the CARES Act offers 10 weeks of paid leave that two-thirds of an employee's rates if they are, for instance, uh, impacted due to child, uh, child care or elder care, um, they're not able to secure that. So that means that your business does need to provide some employment support, at least two-thirds compensation, um, um, while this individual is going through that 10 weeks. And that's kind of covered under that FMLA piece, uh, FMLA CARES. I'll also talk about ADA. So think about ADA as, and, and what I like to talk about most with this is, it's reasonable accommodations. How are you reasonably accommodating your workforce? So if there is an ex extenuating health circumstance, how are you helping? And a great way, or a case example of this would be, what if you have a heart condition and your business, or you know, your your employee says that their doctor recommends that they not come into the workforce because of the situation, and and you know, it, it would be detrimental to their health. What do you do? Right. So I have had circumstances like that. And, and what we've decided is that, that employee will work from home. Maybe we can set them up with special technology to accommodate them to be more successful working from home rather than in the office. Um, so be thinking, how can you accommodate individuals in your business? Sometimes it is unreasonable to you know, uh, accommodate. And that's the, that's the thing with ADA. It says that you must be able to provide reasonable accommodations. So if the accommodation is $10,000 worth of equipment to get something taken care of, that potentially is un, you know, uh, uh, not uh, in favor of the, the organization and could be you know, considered unreasonable. Again, if you are having that fight, I will tell you it is better to consult with an employment attorney than it is to make that decision. And a lot of these things I tell you, you know, especially when you're talking about laws, consult your employment attorney. And if you don't have one and need one, use them. Uh, find one. Um, one resource I'll tell you and I'll, I'll throw out there outside of SHRM, I use another local resource called AIM, E-A, which is uh, AIM uh, 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 Employers Association. That is a St. Louis-based organization originally from Illinois um, and is an amazing resource. So I think it's AAIMEA.com. Awesome, awesome resource. If you apply and uh, sign up, it does cost, but they have some amazing resources for employers out there. For instance, a 24-7 HR hotline, so they can kind of act as your HRs in some way. When we talk about compensation and what that looks like um, and, and how do you develop, say, pay structures, for instance, I'll tell you that uh, um, AIM has a resource or, or you, know, you can use their website to basically submit the job description, and they'll tell you what the compensation should be or what on average it should look like. So again, those are great resources to take advantage of that are out there. Dialing in a little bit more on coronavirus, um, workers' comp is huge right now. I'll tell you on a national level, we're not sure what, what is qualified under workers' comp. A lot of worker comp policies will say communicable, communicable diseases are not covered. Again, that's plan by plan, so please be careful. But I will tell you that worker, uh, uh, workers' comp and the coronavirus are being treated very differently than, say, the cold. Um, it is, it is, I've seen some businesses that are taking worker comp hits. And so to answer, you know, think of workers' comp as you've, you've got an employee that is hurt or injured or has suffered because of the organization. So think about PPE for a moment, because right now PPE is kind of the only thing other than social distancing that is keeping employees safe. These are things that I'm doing in my business that have helped me know that on a, I'll just speak to the county for a moment. The county is requiring face masks. So I would think that it's a good idea to buy face masks for your employees. I wouldn't buy anything special. I keep mine right here in my office, a cloth face mask. I would buy five of them for your employees to use Monday through Friday, whatever your work week looks like. And that way they can throw it in the washer and they can you know, use the new one uh, the next day. That is just a great precautionary measure if you're working in the office and taking care of business so that you can keep employees safe, you're still practicing hopefully the six feet social distancing, and you're, you're minimizing the germ contact. Other things, you know, if, if we're trying to, and, and I'm going to tie this back to workers' comp, 
The idea behind workers' comp is, is that you want to minimize risk, right? And so a way that you defend yourself in a workers' comp claim is that you use every measure possible safety-wise to take care of your employees and prove that you've done everything you can to exhaust all possibilities and you have a better chance of, of basically having the policy rule in your favor that it is truly not a workers' comp claim. So, it, 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 you know, again, we're kind of dialing now into some legal ramifications. And so, again, imp- uh, consult with your employment attorney. But that face mask is a great example. I provided face masks to my employees to make them safer, to help them be safe. We require our employees to wear that. And that's a requirement to be on premise. Other things, Germex, hand sanitizer. That's a great resource. If this is a communicable disease, let's wipe down, you know, our hands. Let's wash our hands. Uh, Lysol wipes or, uh, you know, all those things, disinfectant wipes. That's a great thing to, to, to wipe off our office space. So, again, it's not communicable. Those coffee, uh, um, if we have commu- uh, community coffee, that's probably not a good idea. If everybody's touching the same pump to get their coffee, you know, could there possibly be some form of illness on there? Yes. And, and if it is, you know, covid are you at that point, uh, you know, liable for those damages? And that's, again, the big question mark is, are you, are you not? Um, I will say, you know, if you're a very customer service oriented place and, and you're meeting people face to face, maybe uh, if you've been to a local store, you see a lot of plexiglass kind of sneeze guard looking things. Maybe it's time to invest in some of those. There are some great businesses out there that have provided a lot of these, these uh, tools that I'm talking about or PPE that can really make you successful and safe in your employees. And essentially, all I'm dialing into is that, a co- you know, yes, this is going to cost your business some money. But in the long run, spending the money now saves you in the worker comp claims down the road. And so the more you can make your employees safe, the more you can, you know, keep people socially distant, the better you are in mitigating any risk. Because essentially, at that point, you've potentially taken out all risk in your workforce, in which case you can say, Actually, they didn't contract coronavirus in my organization. Here's everything that I'm doing. Employee, where else are you going or have you been exposed elsewhere? Possibly, yes. So, Next slide. I think that might actually be my last slide. So I, I know I covered a whole bunch of different things here about hiring and bringing people on. I've talked about COVID. Um, there's, again, a lot of challenging things throughout this entire process and, and uh, everything. It's confusing. And so I, I would love to answer any questions if there are any out there. Um, of course, I can provide my email in the, or, uh, in the uh, chat box here so that people can connect with me if they want to. I'm also on LinkedIn. So I always say I'm always a great resource for individuals. Technically, I'm not offering any legal advice. I'm just offering advice that I would use in my organization and business. Um, so it's up to you to, to use what you feel is best for your organization. But I'm always here as a resource if you need it. So 